I will be demonstrating how to assemble a simple bridle joint in this video. In doing so, I'm going to show you how to install the workbench, import parts, constrain parts using the plain coincident constraint, and also how to delete constraints. Let's get started. I normally have it installed already, but I have removed it so that I can show you how to install it if you don't already have it. You can skip this section if you've already installed the workbench. The workbench is installed using the add-on manager. Select the add-on manager from the list of tools. Select workbenches from the show add-ons containing if it is not already selected. Type A2 Plus into the filter box. Now click on the A2 Plus workbench. The add-on manager window displays information about the workbench and provides an install button in the top right corner. Click the install button to install the workbench. You'll need to restart FreeCAD in order to use the workbench, so I will do that now after closing the add-on manager. If you'd like to support my work, please consider buying me a cup of coffee. Your donation will help to improve the channel. A2 Plus requires us to create a file for the assembly before we can start assembling our project. Create a new file by clicking on the New File icon. Now save the file using the Save icon. Give the file a name and click Save. Now let's look at how to import parts. There are a couple of ways to do this. The first allows you to choose one or more parts in a file. And the second imports all parts in the file into the assembly. I'll start by showing how to select the parts that I want to import. I'll import the parts that I prepared earlier for this demonstration. There are two parts in the file and both of them will be imported. Click the Add Shapes from an External File icon. Then select the file containing the parts. Click the Open button to import the parts. Each part is imported into the assembly and can be transformed at will. You use this method when you want to be able to constrain the parts individually. You can also use this method if there is only one part in the file. The last part in this example can be moved simply by moving the mouse and it is fixed in place with a mouse click. This is the method I use for importing parts. Now we'll look at importing the parts in a single file without having the ability to choose which ones we want. Click on the Add Part from an External File icon. Select the file containing the parts. Click the Open button to import the parts. The parts are imported as a single object and cannot be individually transformed. This is useful for importing an existing assembly for use within another assembly. For example, you could have a standard drawer design that you want to reuse in a chest of drawers and you could use this method to import the drawer assembly. The model that I imported is actually an assembly that I created with the A2 Plus workbench for this purpose. I used the steps that I'm about to demonstrate to create this assembly. The A2 Plus workbench documentation describes the imported assembly as a subassembly. As you can see, the parts in the subassembly move as one. Before we go any further, let's have a brief look at degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom are the number of parameters of the system that may vary independently. The Sketcher Workbench documentation describes a line as having four degrees of freedom. It can be moved horizontally or vertically, it can be stretched, and it can be rotated. Applying a horizontal constraint, for example, limits the line's ability to rotate, leaving three degrees of freedom. Constraining one end of the line will further reduce its ability to move, and its degrees of freedom are reduced as well. This applies to components in an assembly as well. We're going to be using the plain coincident constraint later in this video, and the degree of freedom for the component involved will be reduced each time the constraint is applied. I like to think of it as the approximate number of constraints that need to be applied before the two parts are fully constrained, although this is not entirely correct in all cases. You can display the degrees of freedom for all parts by toggling the Print DOF Information icon. Unfortunately, it's only a static display, so you'll need to toggle it on and off to see changes. I'll toggle it on, and you can see that all parts are free, which means they are unconstrained. Notice that the assembly is shown as free. This seems to be the case because the whole assembly is treated as a single object when it is imported like this. The degrees of freedom for each part changes as constraints are applied. I'll show you how to add the constraints shortly, but this montage shows you what you will see.
You'll note that one of the parts is shown as being fixed. As soon as you place your first constraint on the parts, one part becomes fixed and the degrees of freedom apply to the other parts. You can transform the fixed part and the rest of the assembly will be transformed along with it once you refresh the display. I don't normally toggle the display very frequently and really only use it to help diagnose why an assembly is not behaving itself properly. I'm going to leave it toggled on for now. We can now start to constrain the parts. I'm going to start constraining the two individual parts and then constrain the subassembly. I found that you can't constrain a part to a subassembly until one of the individual parts is fixed. I'll start by constraining part B to the left hand end of part A. Select the top face of the tenon on part A and select the top face of the mortise on part B while holding down the control key. Now apply a plane coincident constraint. I will go into the plane coincident constraint in more detail in a future video. But for now, all that is necessary for this video is that the constraint makes the two planes or faces coincident to each other. I will include a link to that video in the video description and the card at the top right when it becomes available. You can see that part A is now fixed in place and part B has three degrees of freedom. Looking at the model tab for the combo view, you'll see that each component has some child objects. These are the constraints that you've added to the model. When I expand side A's constraints, you'll see that there is a plane coincident constraint attached to the part. Similarly, there is one on side B. Each time you constrain two parts, the constraint is added to both of them. You can change the constraints properties in the data tab, but I've never felt the need to do so and don't know how this will impact the model. I'm now going to finish constraining parts A and B and will toggle the degree of freedom display each time. Again, I'll select two faces that need to be coincident and use the add plane coincident tool to add the constraint. Select one face, then select the second face while pressing the control key. Notice how the degrees of freedom drop to one. This happened because part B can only be moved in one direction now. I repeat the steps above to add the last constraint. Select the first face, then select the second face while pressing the control key, and then apply the plain coincident constraint. Part B now has zero degrees of freedom, so it is fully constrained. Now I can move on to constraining the imported subassembly to the one that I'm creating. The process is exactly the same as constraining the individual components. You can see that the A2 Plus workbench does not distinguish between individual parts and a subassembly. But bear in mind that it only does this once two individual parts have been constrained. You don't have to fully constrain your assembly, but I find it best to do so. I have come across situations where I used an incorrect constraint and the next constraint caused an unexpected result. In my case, it was one of the circular constraints, which we'll look at in a future video. Most of the furniture and jigs that I've built use fairly simple joinery, so a fully constrained assembly might be a bit of overkill. But I choose to do it so that I don't forget to do it on furniture where I may need to use more complex joinery. Now let's look at how to delete constraints and the effect on the assembly when we do so. As you know, a child constraint is added to each part every time you apply a constraint. Deleting a constraint works in reverse. A child constraint is removed from each part and the degree of freedom increases as well because there are fewer constraints applied to the part. Select the constraint that you want to delete, then press the delete key or right click on the constraint and select the delete option to delete it. You only need to delete the constraint on one part and FreeCAD automatically deletes the constraint from the other part. You can delete all constraints on a part by selecting them all and then deleting them. This is a way of fixing a model if you've messed up the constraints. Check out the video in the top right corner if you'd like to learn more about the A2 Plus Workbench. I have also created a playlist containing videos about the A2 Plus Workbench. I will be creating more videos which will be added to the playlist. If you'd like to support my work, please consider buying me a cup of coffee. Your donation will help to improve the channel. Thanks for watching. See you next time.